I was going to be preaching. So find that kind of interesting. Uh, and so this morning, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about was our Sunday best. Now, if I took this thing here and tied it around my neck, would it make you feel any better? Would it really make a difference to you with me standing up here? For some of you watching me come up here in jeans with an untucked shirt, uh, although I think it's a nice shirt, uh, might be a little frustrating. And I mean no offense to anybody, uh, nor does this mean that I don't have reverence for God. Uh, by no means am I saying that. As a matter of fact, this morning as I'm getting dressed and getting ready to come over here, um, I'm a little uncomfortable with the way that I am dressed, to be honest with you. So you won't see this again this evening. Uh, you won't ever see it again on a Sunday morning. I, I guarantee you that. But I did want to get this out to you. Um, oftentimes, we see people dressed in the way they come into church on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening, whenever we may get together for services. And for some of us, that's really big and important. How we see people in their attire sometimes will say a lot to us about what we think and where they are spiritually. Right? So does my coat and tie give a different message? I found out this morning, yes, it does. If I wear a coat and tie or I've got a suit on, most of you are assuming that I'm going to be preaching this morning or giving a lesson. I know now that if I come in with an untucked shirt and jeans, probably nobody's really thinking too much about me giving a message this morning. But this goes way back, right? Our Sunday best, and it just doesn't uh, come back to being here at church, but rather what I hear all the time uh, as students at school, Olivet, get ready to take pictures. Sometimes a message will go out, uh, parents send your children with your Sunday's best. Send them with their nicest attire. And so the thought is, if you're going to a service on a Sunday morning, you're going to put on the nicest clothes that you have, right? And I'm not saying here that anybody doesn't have the nicest clothes that they have, right? Because we just don't know. There are some people that live out there with three shirts and two pair of jeans and one pair of shoes or two pair of shoes, and you and I don't know about it, right? We just don't know. Not everybody lives the way that I do. And so what is our Sunday best? What is it that we are called to be dressed as? Or what are we reading the scriptures? Going all the way back to Exodus chapter 28 verses 1, through 1 and 3, we read what some of the things that God said that was required of the priests at that time. And it said, Have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, so they may serve me as priests. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as a priest. Verse 4, these are the garments they are to make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons, so they may serve me as a priest. Have them use gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. Make the ephod of gold and of blue purple and scarlet yarn and of finely twisted linen the work of skilled hands. It is to have two shoulder pieces attached to two of its corners so it can be fastened. It is skillfully woven. Waistband is to be like it, of one piece with the ephod and made with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and with finely twisted linen. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in order of the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel, then mount the stones in the gold filigree settings and fasten them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as a memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron is to bear, Aaron is to bear the names on his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. Make gold filigree settings 
and two braided chains of pure gold, like a rope, and attach the chains to the settings. So here we go. God gives some very clear description of how it is that he wants the priest to dress. He goes fine detail by detail, and if you go to the chapter, you'll see it continues on and on about what it is they're supposed to wear. And the Old Testament's probably got a lot more in it about the attire of the people that are going to worship at this time. Found this just a couple of days ago, as I was preparing for this lesson. Uh, the proper attire inside the church. Just want you to take a look at that. At the very bottom, it gives the name of a religious body, and it says, striving for holiness. It gives the name of the religious body, and it says, striving for holiness. I think I'm okay over here with the untucked shirt. But I find that interesting that them trying to set up a particular way of dressing and how that talks about striving for holiness. That if I dress a particular way, that I will draw closer to holiness. That the way that people see me in a suit and a coat and tie uh, and a starch pair of khakis, uh, as opposed to maybe a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, right? That that might get me any closer to holiness. Kind of interesting where we come. Now many of you, when we talk about this, come to this particular scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the holy temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. A lot of people read this scripture, and whenever they come into services, they will say, well, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and therefore, let me make sure that I'm wearing the best clothes that I've got. Let me make sure that I'm putting a coat and tie on. Let me make sure that I've got the best that I could possibly have. Women, maybe a new dress or the nicest shoes that you've got in your closet. I'm not saying that we shouldn't take this into consideration, right? Correct. Our body is a holy temple for the Spirit. But what does this mean? And do we read this and take a look at other people and decide, oh, well, they're just not taking this seriously. Other people, you know, they're wearing this particular type of shorts or pants or shoes or, you know, their shirt is unbuttoned to the third button. You know, they're not serious about serving God. So, I'm going to give everybody just a moment. Go ahead and turn to the scripture in the Bible, the New Testament. Everybody knows where it's at, right? Everybody go ahead and turn to the scripture in the New Testament that tells us how we're supposed to dress. I'm going to give you all just a moment. Everybody knows it, right? Because we've heard it over and over and over again. The scripture that tells us exactly what we're supposed to wear. Nobody's turning. Oh, there's some stuff there about women not dressing like men and men not dressing like women. There's some things in there about women dressing modestly, about not wearing gold or silver or, you know, wearing their heads in a braid. And uh, there, there are some probably some other things here and there. But nobody's found the scripture that we always go to to tell how people to dress. Why not? Because it doesn't exist. There is no scripture that tells us what our attire should look like when we're coming in here to serve, serve God. As a matter of fact, I'll take it even a step further. Are we Christians only on Sundays? No. Do we worship God only on Sundays? No. When do we worship God? Every single day, 24-7, 365 my life should be focused on worshiping God. And so therefore, should I wear a coat and tie nonstop, even when I'm sleeping? If that's what I'm called to do? 
And I think back to Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon that has ever been preached, and this is what happened. Jesus has been out doing some works. He's been healing people. He's been uh, getting apostles to follow after him. He's, he's working his ministry. And Matthew chapter 5, as he gets ready to preach the greatest sermon that has ever been preached, it says, And seeing the multitude, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, I want you to take a look at this. Picture this in your mind. They're on the side of a mountain, side of a hill, even if it's a hill, it's a big hill. On the side of the hill, and it says that he walks up. And it says that people have been following him for days. If you go back to chapter 4, we'll read that here in just a moment. But people have been following him now for days. There's probably quite a few people that are following him. And so he works his way up to the hill or to the mountain and he begins to preach. Do you think Jesus stopped to pay attention to what people were wearing? You've got to imagine that hill is dusty and dirty. Uh, probably no place to sit other than the dirt. Maybe a rock if you're lucky it's going to hold you up. That's the scene that I get. And if you go back to chapter 4, it seems like they've been along this journey for quite some time. Matthew chapter 4. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. They immediately left their nets, took a bath, changed their clothes, and followed him? No. It says, as he called them, it would be like saying, Randy, come with me. And Randy dropped everything he was doing, and he just took off walking right after me. I don't know if you've been fishing here lately, but fish don't smell too good. And so here you have these two men. Jesus walks by them and he says, come and follow after me. And they take off following after him. And we don't know whether before we get to the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, we don't know how much time is there. But let's say there's not a big gap of time there. Let's say it happens in a day or two. Good chance these gentlemen still haven't changed their clothing, still haven't bathed, and yet they're going to the mountain. Think Jesus is concerned about what they're wearing, what they look like, what they smell like? I think not. And Jesus went out about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. If Jesus is out and about teaching and healing, and he's healing people that are ill, I can't imagine what that's like. It's not like a nice hospital that we have today. We have an air-conditioned room, and nurses, you know, make sure that you're clean. Right? That's not what we're looking at here. So if you have people that are ill, people that are sick, and Jesus is amongst them continuously, and there's hot weather, no fans, no air conditioning as you and I have it today. Can you imagine what those people are dressed like and what they might smell like if they've been sick for some time? And then we get to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus goes up on the mountain, he begins to preach. I don't think that he stopped to ask them if what they were wearing actually makes the mark. But this is what the Bible says. This is what he told when he was looking for David. This is what, this is what he said. He said, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see a man as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So God talks to Samuel as he's bringing all the sons in and he's going, is this the one? Is this the one? Is this surely this is the one? The one that's big in stature and that's good looking? Surely this is the one. Well, we got one more. Surely this is the one. None of them passed the test. 
God says, this is not the one I've chosen until David comes in. God tells them, don't look at them like man look at them. Look at them the way I look at them. I look at their hearts. And so what attire do we need to be looking at? What's important to God? Luke chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, he's addressing the Pharisees. It said, then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did, he, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And so the Pharisees had these really nice get-ups as well, didn't they? They had these clothes that they wore that set them apart, that had the fine colors, that had very elaborate costumes, if you want to call it that, that set them apart from everybody else. But he says, you know, what about the outside? You have these rituals and these things that you follow after. When you wash your dishes, before you eat, you clean the inside. I said, but what about the outsides? So although they look very nice, they look very priestly, they look very official, their hearts were wrong. And so he warns them. And so you've got to remember, the Pharisees are the well-churched, right? These are the ones that have been given the law, they've been given the teachings, these are the ones who are supposed to make sure that they're following exactly the way God asked them to follow. How many of us fall in that category? Been in the church 16, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And we're responsible for passing on the doctrines and the teaching of the Bible to make sure that we're worshiping the way that we should. We have to ask ourselves, when somebody stands up here with an untucked shirt and jeans, does it offend you? When we see somebody who comes in that may not have been in the church for a while, does that offend you? Does it bother you in the way that they behave, in the way that they may be dressed? Does the way people are dressed announce to you in your mind and in your heart that that person may not be spiritual and that the way that they show up? We have to be careful with that, right? Because then that takes me away from me being holy. That takes me away from me honoring God. That takes me away from me looking out to somebody who is not in church longer, as long as I have that doesn't understand the scriptures yet. So in Colossians chapter 3, in verse 12, it reads this. In mine, it has a title, The Character of a New Man. It says, Therefore, as the elect of God... Holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long suffering. Sorry about meekness. What's interesting about this scripture, though, right, is this it says, put on. That doesn't mean that you wake up with it, it doesn't mean that it comes natural. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be there. You have to work at it. You have to work at these qualities, building the character of a new man of God who is obedient to Jesus and his will and what God has set for us to do. Being Having tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering are not my normal spiritual attire unless I am growing in God Unless I'm moving in the direction that he wants me to go, that's not natural. Why? I'll tell you, I'm selfish. We are all selfish. From a very young age, if we cry loud enough, everybody gives us exactly what we want, right? And I didn't like kids when we were young playing with my truck. That was my truck. It starts that young and it continues throughout our lifetime until we become familiar with the word of God until we commit ourselves to understanding what the scripture says, until we commit ourselves to the spirit allowing change to take place in us through understanding the scriptures. And we understand who Jesus is, who Jesus was, what he came and did for us, and understand that he is our example. You know, every morning when I get up, Barb is still asleep, and so I quietly try to gather my clothes together, and I walk, and, and I'm carrying everything to the couch. That's where I go and get dressed. Right? And then when I go to put my socks on, you know that little stitching right on top that goes right past my toes? 
I got to be very careful about how I put that on because I'll put those socks on sometimes and I put my shoe over it and it's irritating me and bothering me. Sometimes I'm lazy and I just said, ah, I'll be okay. And 10 o'clock, it's driving me nuts there at work. We got to be very intentional about how we put things on, right? If I don't tie my belt just right, then my pants are going to be falling all day long, right? Never mind that I got a match, right? Brown belt, brown shoes, black belt, black shoes. Did I get my buttons lined up? Because if I don't, then I'm all off on the buttons. Did I tie my tie right? Is it crooked? Those are things I got to think about every single day. But when you wake up in the morning, are you thinking about putting on tender mercies? Are you thinking about putting on kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering? This is our attire every single day as Christians. Did you put it on this morning? Sunday's pretty easy, right? Sunday mornings to get dressed as a Christian, that's pretty easy. Why? Because we're focused in on serving God. We know we're coming here to a good place with good people who are like-minded and worshiping God, right? But will you stay dressed once you walk out of here this morning? Will you get dressed again this evening when you come back, if you come back? And more importantly, how are you living every single day? Are you more concerned about this attire and the outward appearance than you are about the inward appearance and the new creation of God, our new character as man? And it doesn't happen overnight. I can't emphasize this enough. It says, put on. You have to work at it. It's like the socks. When you slip them over your feet, you got to make sure you put them on just right because if not, they're not going to serve their purpose with comfort. And here's the thing. you got to learn to put that on early on. And you have to work at it early, early on. But it's like everything else. If the lights are off and it's dark now, I can string my belt without missing a belt loop. I can tie my shoes without having to look as I'm tying that knot. I can tie a tie in the dark and it's going to be straight. Because I've had practice at doing that. When you live a life committed to God and you're focused on serving Him every single day, every hour of your life, this putting it on becomes habit. Not so much habit and the need that you have to have a habit, but it becomes habit because that's the way you want to live your life. Tender mercy is not a word that we use very often, but this is what I found on it. Special blessings such as loving kindness, consolation, assurance, gentle guidance. I think back to the woman at the well. Go and sin no more. Right after, he told her she had six husbands. That's that gentle assurance. That's encouraging. That's a tender mercy. But when we see our brethren sin... Do we have that tender mercy? When somebody messes up in their life, in their church, are we prepared for it? Do we extend those tender mercies as Christ extended to us? When somebody's young and new in the church and they keep messing up, maybe it's the way we worship, maybe it's the way they're dressed, maybe it's because they still got sin that continues to get a hold of them every Friday and Saturday night of the week and before Sunday morning. Are we able to extend those tender mercies? Do we know what it looks like? We should, because Christ extended it to us. Kindness, the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. Well, I'm just a sour person. I haven't had my coffee this morning. Right? Stub my toe on the way out the door. No. There's no excuse for it. We've got to work at this. Kindness needs to be in the tip of our tongues and in our heart every single day. And as Christians, we shouldn't have a choice. Put kindness on. Humility, modest or low view of one's own importance, humbleness. And did Christ ever demonstrate this for us? And yet this one, many of us struggle with it so much. Being humble. There used to be a t-shirt way back in the day in the 70s. It's hard to be humble when you're from Texas. Right? 
Remember that, those were big. Ah, meekness, you're not going to be able to read it again. Meekness, being quiet, gentle, and easily imposed on, submissive. Quiet and gentle is the most important. Being meek doesn't mean that you're weak. Being meek doesn't mean that you have a stand. Being meek sometimes is just saying, do I really need to say what I need to say right now? Is it better for me just to hold my tongue and not say what I think I should say so that I can keep the peace and not offend my brother? Or whoever it is that we might be trying to live a life around so that they can come to know God. Long-suffering, having or showing patience in spite of troubles, especially those caused by other people. Man, am I getting tested at work with this right now? Six months left to go. Things are pretty, pretty tough there at work, and every day I think, okay, God, what do you want me to learn? And if I can stay focused on that, I can continue to try to put that on. It's being tested right now really well. But I wake up every morning and think about, okay, put that patience on, Brawley, which long-suffering kind of falls in the same area. Put that on. Take it with you. You may not feel like it's working very well, but you've got to have it in your toolbox. Every morning when we wake up, do not forget Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Your spiritual attire is what matters most. It's what matters most. What are we wearing? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 and 20 through 29, read this. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. Well, we all just went through that. We just took of the Lord's Supper, remembering the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and how that gives us redemption, how that will give us that opportunity to be with God someday. And what we do or what we should be doing every single day is we should be looking inwardly. We should be discerning whether or not we're worthy to take the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. Did our spiritual attire hold up for the week? Did I look like a Christian? Am I still growing in that new creation that God is creating in me? And if not, I have to ask myself, should I be taken to the Lord's Supper? Outwardly, nobody knows what I'm doing. If you look at me, I still look like BC always looks. You have no idea what sins I'm carrying. But I'm charged with examining myself. You are charged with examining yourself every week. And when we don't, when we just go through the motion and know, okay, it's, it's, it's Sunday and i got to take the Lord's Supper, and you take it, careful. We have to be very careful about that. Jesus attire, my example... Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Our example and our understanding of how to live life and how to serve God comes from Jesus and what he did to teach us. It comes from the example that he lived when he was here on earth and he came here to change the world. Jesus did not come to leave everything status quo. He came to change the world. He disrupted the world when he came to this earth with the teachings that God put before him, with the commands that God gave him, and expected each one of them to live by him. Quite different from what the Pharisees were teaching. He was humble. He was forgiving. 
He was loving, committed to doing God's will to the point of death. That's the example that he gives us. That's the spiritual attire that he wore so that you and I would know how to serve God. So you and I would know what it was that we were striving for. In and of ourselves, there's no way we can get there. But through God and the help of the Holy Spirit, we become a new creation. We are able to wear a new attire. But remember what it says in Colossians 3.12. You have to put it on. You have to make up your mind. I have to make up my mind to put that attire on. But please don't judge me with an untucked shirt and jeans. And I don't think any of you did. I think any, many of you know who I am, know how I strive to live. And I hope that you know my heart. Not anywhere close to being right or perfect. But it's a continual work in putting on that spiritual tire that we need. The only way you know how to find that spiritual tire. The only way that you know how that looks. Is if you have a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you know what it was that he did and how he walked when he was on this earth. And if you have, don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have no idea what this means. But we'll be happy to teach you. We'll help you to get you back on track of maybe you're off just a little bit right now. Water's well, the baptismal always ready. Today's a good day. Not the only day, but it's a great day to get this done. We invite you to stand and come forward if you have any needs. So we stand and sing the song of invitation.